Well, I think we're going to get started. Um, anyone who's coming on later is about to catch up, I guess. <laughs> so if we want to start with an opening word of prayer, you just bow your heads. Loving, merciful, heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this new day that we've been blessed with. Another opportunity to look into your word together, to be encouraged and strengthened concerning the message that is therein. We pray you help us have open hearts and minds as we read from your word and discuss this amongst ourselves. We pray for those who are not able to join us this morning. You know what their reasons are. We pray you would grant a special blessing upon them as you see fit. And Lord, ultimately, we pray for the soon return of your son, Jesus. We look forward to that day, knowing that when he returns, all things will be changed and your kingdom will be established on this earth with your son ruling as king. We look forward to that day and pray that you'll help us on our walk together as we walk towards your kingdom. We praise you and thank you through Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Uh, so for anyone who wasn't here last week, um, we uh, picked up at verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 11. Some of the things we looked at last week, uh, we considered the act of faith that was uh, mentioned in Hebrews 11 for us concerning Joseph. We looked at the background of his life, um, considered why this um, incident was recorded in the chapter. We then moved on to uh, a consideration of uh, some of the acts of Moses. Um, as you notice, there's, there's quite a few verses throughout this chapter that focus on Moses specifically. Uh, that start from the beginning of his life, um, focusing on the faith of his parents, and then moving on through different stages of his upbringing. Um, part of it being uh, with the daughter of Pharaoh uh, within the Egyptian courts. And then when he's come to this realization that uh, the things that are around him are temporal. Uh, meanwhile, there's something eternal in store for him you know, through his connection to the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I think the underlying theme that we looked at last week was the fact that um, the people we considered, you know, they, they did the right thing uh, despite possible consequences that could have come their way or did uh, occur in their life you know they did this despite those uh, difficulties that they faced um, we looked a bit in the book of Daniel and um, there was uh, quite a bit of discussion last week about uh, how fear came into play and the different kinds of fear that we saw um, the fear that the midwives had how they didn't fear Pharaoh's command, but they feared God instead. And also uh, looking at Moses, the faith that Moses' parents had and how, you know, ultimately uh, Moses took hold and, and uh, was developing his faith, you know. And so this week we're picking up at verse uh, 25, um, again, we're, we're, still, we're still getting into uh, Moses some more. And like I said, the last thing that we really brought up was that, uh, you know, throughout their trials, they chose to do what was right, uh, even though there were consequences. And we're going to see that theme uh, continue to play out in the next few verses we're going to consider this morning. Um, one of the points I really like last week, uh, that came out a few times was that in, instead of, you know, enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season or the riches of Egypt, um, it really brought forth how Moses, you know, forsook those things, just like, you know, we shouldn't put a lot of, um, emphasis on, um, you know, material blessings that we have for those temporal things versus, you know, the promise is that through Christ, we too are attached. 
Um, so I'm just going to read Hebrews 11, verse 25, just to start off. And it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And so um, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. That's 1 Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse 17. And it says, For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so if you remember last week, um, I would mentioned that uh, the, uh, the, the prophet Stephen, when he was, he was before the religious council, um, he spoke highly of the faith expressed by men of old, like Moses, uh, in Acts chapter 7. And we're going to be jumping all around. We're going to be looking a bit of Acts, at Acts chapter 7 because it, it connects really well with Hebrews chapter 11, especially the verses that we're discussing this morning. And so he notes in Acts chapter 7, verse 17, that despite Pharaoh's decree of death, the children of Israel grew and multiplied according to the promises made to Abraham. So turn with me to Acts chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 17 through 20. And uh, Sister Kathy, if you could read that. So that's Acts chapter 7, verses 17 through 20. And of course, if anyone has any comments or questions, feel free to interject at any time. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, verses 17 through 20. Yep. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt surely with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. All right, thank you. Something that really stood out to me when I read um, this section of verses, uh, you'll notice in verse 20, at the end, it says that Moses was nourished up in his father's house three months. Now, I, I looked at a, a few different commentaries, and for the most part, they, they do their best to attach um, when it talks about his father's house um, in, in relation to, you know, our heavenly father. And I'm not 100% convinced. And so I am looking for some input on this. Um, if anyone has any thoughts about it. Um, now, when I, when I looked into it, you know, even though I'm not certain whether there's an absolute connection between the word father and our heavenly father, um, it would be incorrect for us to believe that God was not watching over Moses during this time. And when I looked into it, it is the same word, you know, when it references Heavenly Father. And it, it's actually used close to 100, 400 other times uh, throughout the New Testament. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Um. I don't, I don't really understand what you're asking. I'm so sorry. When it talks about Moses being nourished up in his father's house three months, do you, do you think that's a reference to just pointing out that God was, you know, God was nour one nourishing him? Or do you think it was, um, you know, his physical father, you know, Amram, 
that it's referencing, you know, just the general day to day taking care of. I always thought I referred to his mother nursing him, like nurse, nursing him for three months before she turned him over to, to you know, Rafiro's house. Mm -hmm. I feel it's the, uh, it's just his, his, the three months before you had to be put in the basket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, see, that, that makes more sense. Um, you, you never know with the different commentaries, the kind of background and stuff like that. All right, I got a knock. <laughs> All righty. Well, if we don't have any other comments about that section, let's let's move on. Hey, uh, hey Brian. So, yeah. I, I will say that you know that there's the point that's made in Hebrews chapter eleven that says um, in verse twenty three it says by faith Moses when he was born was hidden three months by his parents. So I think what that's saying there is that the parents themselves had faith, you know, because they were supposed to kill their you know, all the male boys were supposed to be put to death. And I'm sure if they didn't, then the parents would be put to death, you know. So, you know, perhaps there's there's a little bit of a connection there that, that, that these were very faithful, you know, that Moses' mom and dad were a very faithful couple. And they were willing to, uh, you know, risk their lives to save their child. And so, you know, perhaps there's some kind of a connection there between the father's house and, and the faith of the parents. Because they yeah. certainly, they certainly showed faith by by you know by hiding him for three months because they put their lives you know in, in jeopardy by doing this and then you know they named him Moses which is to you know I think they were supposed to cast the, the child into the sea and Moses means to be drawn out um, so you know they 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 showed faith by by naming him that they rather than throwing him in the water he was going to be drawn out of the water so you know I, th I think you can see that they have a tremendous amount of faith and then in three months they put him in that basket and put him in the river and kind of put him in God's hands and so um you know I, I think there may be a little connection there mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense all right th thank you for your comments was it uh the original parents that named him Moses or was it the princess it's the princess which, yeah, I was trying to remember that. Um, oh, yeah, you may be right. You may be right. Yeah, because there was a point made that uh, I, it was either she didn't change his name to an Egyptian name or um, it was, it was, I'm trying to remember exactly who named him, but I, I believe, I believe it was the daughter that named him. Because she she referenced having brought him out of the water. Because remember she had he had found him when she had gone down to the water to bathe. Yeah, um, you, you're probably right. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it, it refers to them as a that they saw that he was a beautiful in the King James. I think in other translations it says he was a proper child. Mm -hmm. So and, and it says they were not afraid of the king's commandment. So. They definitely had a, a, an aspect of faith, recognizing, you know, that there, that I, I think they recognized this child was, you know, someone that God would take care of, and and so he was certainly, I think he was certainly being nourished in those three months in a God-fearing home. Put it that way. In mm -hmm. Exodus two ten, that is when the Pharaoh's daughter named him. She called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. But correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, Moses is a Hebrew name. So it, it's, it's interesting to me that, you know, an Egyptian would give a child a Hebrew name. You know, other than the fact that she, she recognized it was one of the Hebrew children right away. Um, I think the word Ramses is the same root. It's really Ra Moses. Oh, okay. but it has the God Ra in front of it. When I looked it up years ago. <laughs> oh, that's fair. <laughs> well, didn't didn't she give um, the child back to his mother to raise to yeah. nurse? Mm -hmm. She yeah, to his sister, Miriam.
was following it, remember? And Miriam ran up and said, I believe something like, you know, she knew who the mother was and uh, she allowed the mother to raise it. And that was a blessing given to, given to her, her, her that she was allowed to take this child through the, the first uh, months of its life um, like that. God did not leave that family destitute of knowing that child. Uh, there was no secret that Moses was a Hebrew, um, like Hollywood makes it. It was very well known he was Hebrew. So, mm -hmm. yeah, because she she didn't have to give him back to the daughter until he was weaned. Right. Um, he you know, which a Hebrew. could have been a significant amount of time. He's true. Mm -hmm. He looked out on his brother. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, let's continue moving on. Uh, so Hebrews 11, verse 24, uh, highlights Moses' act of faith that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This wasn't something that was recorded as being an immediate thing. It notes in the verse uh, that it occurred when he had grown in years. And, you know, once again, Stephen in Acts chapter 7, uh, in verse 22, mentions specifically that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So at this point, he had been indoctrinated with the mindset and knowledge of the Egyptians. And so he was faced with a life altering choice. You know, when he decided to remove himself from this, this what we would look at as being like a, a very good situation in terms of he was well supported, he had access to, you know, innumerable amount of wealth and support and stuff like that. And so Moses' choice is recorded for us in Hebrews 11, verse 25, where it says that he's choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And so Moses purposefully chose to suffer affliction and rejoin himself to the people of God. And we're given a little more insight again in Acts chapter 7, verse 23. It says that it came into Moses' heart to visit his brethren. And according to that verse, it says that he was 40 years old. Now, this feeling that entered Moses' heart brought him into a situation which required a split-second decision on his part. This incident is recorded for us in Exodus chapter 2. And uh, Sister Leah, if you could read for me Exodus chapter 2 and reading verses 11 through 15. Okay. Exodus 2, 11 through 15. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Thank you. Now, it, it, it's interesting to me, you know, this, this whole situation, because it, it, it doesn't, give us any indication you know about how God felt about Moses's response to um, you know the Egyptian beating as it, it's referenced one of his brethren um, but let, let's take a look at Acts chapter 7 again and brother Roger if you could read for me verse 24 and 25 All right. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. 
for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Thank you. So, from Stephen's perspective, um, you know, we get to see a little bit more behind the scenes of the process and you know, the way it comes off in Acts chapter 7, you know, if when we, when we see someone suffering wrong and we react, you know, that's, that's a, a good thing. You know, when we, when we go out of our way to defend someone who's, who's um, you know, suffering wrong. So it, this, these two verses... You know, still have me wondering a little bit about how God felt about this uh, this incident that Moses went through. Does anyone have any comments about about those couple verses that we're reading here? I have a, a possible scenario to, to consider because um, it says, obviously, we from these verses we can see that it was no secret he was a Hebrew. And Moses would have thought they would have understood. So there's this openness there about who he is. It's no secret. Like I say, again, we live in a time where Hollywood portrays it as always a big secret that was covered up and nobody knew. But that's not true. And these verses show that. But consider this here. If they knew, here was a Hebrew in the palaces of Egypt living this lifestyle. And many of them possibly lost their siblings during those years. You know, they, their, their brothers, their little brothers or older brothers or whatever were thrown into the river and they lost that relationship. And there could have been the reason they couldn't have recognized them. And I'm just suggesting this based on the emotions that could be tied to it, is that there was a great jealousy about him or, you know, because many had lost siblings and here he sits in palaces um i know it's not recorded but why would these men react this way why would this guy react this way um because he he did kill an egyptian which they probably would have cherished <laughs> to some degree you know but they they may have had a lot of baggage with him uh, why he needed to go another reason he may have needed to go away for 40 years I don't know. I just throw that out there to consider um, that many suffered loss and Moses was saved. And if you didn't know that God's hand was in it, it could be very difficult to swallow. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Anyway, and it, just throw that out there. <laughs> there's another yeah. thing. Too. Um, were you done, Brian? Oh, it's okay. You can you can make comment. Okay. Um, the other thing too is that um, you know. I believe when Stephen was reciting this event that he was comparing Moses to Jesus and he was comparing how the Israelites back then treated Moses, you know, where, whereas, uh, you know, the Israelites in Jesus's day would not accept him um, and completely rejected him. So um, what's interesting to me is that Moses, you know, was defending them um you know the egyptians who were idol worshipers and here you, you know you had the romans over the jews right in jesus day um and jesus was actually saving the jews although they didn't know it uh at the hands of the romans because the romans were the ones who crucified him so but the real enemy was was of course sin you know the real enemy that jesus uh conquered was sin but anyway, um, not to get too, um, you know, analytical about this, but in verse 14, where it says, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Um, I think it's interesting when you think about the verse where Jesus uh, told the parable of, you know, who is the manager that, um, you know, the household or owner has put over his household to feed his servants while he's away. You know, blessed is that man who he finds so doing. But he said, if that man starts to think to himself, oh, my master's a long time coming, and he begins to uh, eat and drink with the drunkards and to beat his fellow servants, 
that his master will come on a day when he doesn't expect it. And so, you know, here these Jews were starting to beat up on each other. And here Moses, you know, he was a type of Christ. He was the prince and the judge who had arrived among them to deliver them from slavery, you know, and he was the type of Jesus who would deliver us from sin. But they were like unwilling to accept him as their deliverer. So I think it's, you know, it's very similar to our situation. And it was also similar to the Jews in Jesus' day who were beginning to eat and drink with the drunkards and to beat their fellow servants. They put burdens on people that were way too heavy for people to bear. And they wouldn't lift a finger, you know, to hold the burdens up themselves and things like that. Mm -hmm. no, good comment. Thanks. <clears throat> All righty. So when we consider verse 25, and we we kind of pick it apart a little bit here, um, we have the, we have a couple words. We have the word affliction, uh, and so the definition of affliction is a cause of persistent pain or distress. Now, imagine for a moment yourself, you know, putting yourself in Moses' shoes, you know, and choosing this path of persistent pain or distress versus, you know, the pleasures of sin. Contrary to that, the definition of pleasures is labeled as being a state of gratification. And now the scriptures hold a vast amount of verses that address this age-old situation that Moses and many other men and women of old faced. Consider the words found in 1 John chapter 1, sorry, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And if I could get uh, Brother Paul, if you could read that for us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Okay. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. And I think, I think this section of verses here really sums up the mindset that Moses was developing. And it also points to the other men and women of old who were given these promises. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 5 concerning the fruits of the Spirit. And he writes in verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And so it speaks of the mindset that we as believers need to have. Moses had this kind of mindset, as did all those who came before him, as made evident in our study so far. Moses' struggles and his ability to believe in something eternal, instead of focusing all of his strength on temporal things, reminds us of our daily struggle to focus our minds on eternal things to come. The acts of faith that we have read about so far exemplify the fact that faith requires action. Joseph made a point to give his family encouragement concerning the future, informing them about the great exodus that would certainly occur in the future of the children of Israel. And Moses, as we've explored so far, including his parents and the midwives, showed incredible faith and did the right thing regardless of the possible consequences. So turn back with me to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 26. A 
That's Hebrews 11, verse 26. And it says, Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And if, I feel like that, that verse is quite a mouthful. I don't think you could read it very quickly. It's something we really need to slow down and, and uh, really take a good look at. And so we've, we've considered verse 24 and 25. And what's one thing that stood out to me is that these two verses appear to focus primarily on the act. So the action that Moses performed because of his faith. And now verse 26 and 27 seem to focus more on the why, the reason behind it. And so let's, let's kind of uh, take this verse apart a little bit. It says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Okay. We have, you know, we have this first, this first part of the verse. And then it says, because he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So I think it'd be helpful to consider what the word esteem means. And when, when you look it up online, it's defined as to respect or admire highly. Now Moses, Moses's choices that he had made up to this point pointed forward to a belief in an eternal promise. Moses made these choices like many others before him because he looked at everything that was available at his fingertips, mainly because of his position. And he said, you know, I don't want anything to do with that. He, he pushed it away from himself. He, he separated himself from it. Now this reminds me of two examples. I'm, I'm sure there are others. Uh, those being uh, of Queen Esther and also uh, three well-known men, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, we're all familiar with the book of Esther and how in Esther chapter 3, there's a, a decree put forward by a wicked man, namely Haman, which would allow the needless death of Jews. And so we read in Esther chapter four uh, concerning Mordecai, you know, immediately after this decree has been made. If you want to turn with me to Esther chapter four. And, and because this is a, a well-known Story. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. I just think, feel like it's important for us to consider uh, other men and women that um, are, are find themselves in a similar situation. So Esther chapter 4, verse 1, it says, When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. And so, because of this, Mordecai is brought before Queen Esther, and he explains what has happened and presents her with what she needs to do. Uh, look at uh, Esther chapter 4, verse 13. He says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall there enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? You know, ultimately, Esther risks her life. And she approaches the king and begs for the lives of the people. You know, a similar situation, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. Again, you know, a king who doesn't know God agrees to this, this decree. He, uh, king Nebuchadnezzar, he constructs an image 
that he expects everyone to bow down to. And those three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, chose to risk their lives and disobey the king's decree. Uh, Jason Winterland, could you read for us Daniel chapter 3, verse 13 to 18? Uh, I'm putting it up right now. So Daniel chapter 3, verse 13, 3, 18. Right, Daniel <clears throat> chapter 3, starting in verse 13. When Nebuchadnezzar, then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I make, have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is this God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace and will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. All right, thank you. So again, we have this, this continuing theme of men and women, um, you know, risking their lives ultimately, you know, forsaking these temporal blessings and looking forward to an eternal promise. So the second word I'd like to look at briefly is the word recompense, which by definition means Compensation or reward given for loss or harm suffered or effort made. And so, as we're well aware, Moses was not able to commit these acts of faith through his own strength. God's hand is very visible when he directs Moses. Throughout Moses' life, because of the faith that he had, was able to endure the difficulties. He was able to see him who is invisible. Isaiah 40, verse 31, is a well-known verse that illustrates the strength that only God can supply, you know, both to Moses and other men and women of old, as well as to us, as we wait patiently for his son's return and the fulfillment of the promises in our own lives. Isaiah 40, verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. So we only have a couple more minutes left. Uh, next week, we're going to continue looking at Moses. You know, we're not done yet. There's still several verses that specifically reference him and further acts of faith. Um, I figure we're, we got at least a couple more weeks, probably closer to three, maybe four, <laughs> we'll have some material. Um, today, we don't have any um, comments. To close at our session this morning. Yes, Brian. <clears throat> I was listening, but I also looked up Moses and Ramses again because it's been a while. So Ramses means child of the sun, which is Ra, the sun god, and Mises is to be born. So Mises also can mean drawn from or deliver from water. So I think it's interesting. It's it's called uh, Moshe in Hebrew. Um, the daughter of Pharaoh thought it, he was delivered from the water, right? He was born of the water, but really <laughs> he ended up delivering from the water later on in his life. So it's kind of interesting. And if you think of him as a type of Christ, you know, it's through baptism that we are delivered from death too. So it's kind of an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh. thank, thank you for bringing that up. It would just maybe a little uh, add to what Martha said. It just kind of hit me as she was speaking that 
you know, then he carried, took them through the water of the Red Sea. Right. Yeah. And which was a type of baptism. Mm -hmm. And that very water destroyed the Egyptians. Yes. This is, yeah. Once Martha said that, it just sort of popped Put up uh, in the head up there of, of the possible many connections to that one moment in time where she lifted him out of that basket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, you know, that water, it was uh, in reference to just the water that Moses was uh, drawn from. You know, it, was, it, it on one hand, it could be a source of destruction, you know, the drowning mm -hmm. of all the male children. But then you also have, on the other hand, you know, a, a source of deliverance, you yeah. know, and, and new life because mm -hmm. of that. So. Hey, Brother yeah, Brian. Yep. <laughs> I was just thinking about that verse that says, uh, you know, not many wise, not many noble have been called, <clears throat> you know, for God has chosen the foolish things of this world and found the wise. Mm -hmm. But Moses was noble, you know, he was wise. He was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, you know, and I was just wondering, you know, as far as life application goes, because we can read about these well-known Bible figures and we can think about their lives, but, you know, if we never apply it to our own lives, then it's just a theoretical consideration. Um, but I was just wondering, you know, how many of us or do we know any other believers um, who let's just say had great promise in this world, you know, very intelligent, very on the road to, you know, being ex considered very extremely successful in this world, um, maybe wonderfully educated or talented or what have you, who like Moses, when would, they were presented with the gospel and what Jesus had done for them, said nothing in this world is worth their dedication to Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely something to think about. All right. Well, we are, we are a few minutes over time. Uh, Brother Brad, if I could get you to close Sunday school in prayer. Sure. Thank you. Our Father who art in heaven, we are very thankful that you have blessed us with this time to consider your servant Moses and as we recognize the dedication in faith that he gave himself towards even late in life uh, we we appreciate that example we pray that we would learn from it that when we are placed in positions to choose your will that we would do so when we fail to do so we we recognize our sins and pray that you would be forgiving but that through those times that we would learn from our mistakes and, and seek above all things to, to do what pleases you, to forward your will and purpose in this earth, as so many of these faithful have done for our learning and our example. Guide us in that way of faithfulness and service before you, we pray, as seeking your kingdom to come, and for your guidance to be with each of us and, and the believing community in this town and elsewhere in the world until that time does come, that we might all be blessed together in service to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Yep. Good work, Brian. Thank you. Brian, right. take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. We love you. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs>